Hello everyone. Welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Dhiman Bhattacharya, Assistant Professor of Comparative Literature, Center for Comparative Literature, Bhasha Bhavan, Vishubharati. The author of this particular course is Dr. Shagota Bhattacharya. This particular course deals with Canadian literature and this module deals with multiculturalism in Canada. The learning objectives of this particular module are what is multiculturalism? When did Canada adopt multiculturalism as an official policy? Who were the people responsible who drafted the policy of multiculturalism in Canada? The after effects of adopting this policy of multiculturalism in Canada. Multiculturalism in Canada. Canada is often described as a multicultural nation. Simply stated, it means that Canadians do not belong to any one cultural background, race or heritage. Instead, Canadians reflect a vast diversity of cultural heritages and racial groups. This diversity is a result of centuries of immigration. All Canadians, with the exception of the native people, trace their origins to an immigrant past. However, this does not imply that the majority of Canadians today are immigrants. According to Statistics Canada, only about 16% of today's Canadian citizens were born outside Canada. It also states that anyone who wants to immigrate to Canada may not do so since immigration to Canada is a privilege and not a birthright. As per the government policies since the 1900s, Canada has remained selective as to who may enter the country and equally important who may not. During most of the 17th and 18th centuries, immigration continued. Settlers came mainly from Britain, including English, Scots and Irish. Many were drawn to the opportunities of the New World, while others, including many Scots and Irish, escaped the famine and starvation which forced them to vacate their homelands. Many Americans too moved north to acquire more land. The 19th century, particularly the second half of it, saw migration to Canada from other nations, including the non-whites. In the years before the American Civil War, Europeans were joined by thousands of black slaves who had escaped by following the underground railway northward into Canada. After the Canadian Confederation in 1867, thousands of Chinese laborers were imported as workers to build the Canadian Pacific Railway. On the Pacific coast, other Chinese joined the rush of fortune hunters from all over the world. The demands of the labor market also made it inevitable that South Asian and Southeast Asian immigrants find employment in the Canadian job market. Hence, by the 20th century, Canada was battling with immigrants coming from various parts of the world and belonging to various ethnicities. Many of them were not desired by the government. Also, there were some who wished to stay only for a short period of time to earn first money and go back to where they came from. Well, before the Second World War, Canada was already home to people from a wide range of cultural backgrounds. But not everyone was equally welcomed in Canada. It was a commonly accepted notion that Canada was a land of the whites and hence non-whites were mostly considered foreigners or others. It was considered that since their race, color, religion or customs were different from Canadians, 
they would find it difficult to mix in the society and be suitable citizens. While the government needed laborers in work in the prairies, forests, factories and mines, the Canadian public in general detested the idea of hiring in the process allowing entry of colored immigrants into the country. The growing fear was that these non-whites can never assimilate and fit into the Canadian society at large. Thus, the general public resented their entry into the land. The French Canadians also feared that the growing number of colored immigrants might tip Quebec's delicate French-English political and social balance in favor of the non-French. As anti-immigrant sentiment started to spread the public demand that the government restrict immigration, to this the government responded with a set of new regulations. Since the 1900s, the admission of Eastern Europeans was made difficult. Asian immigration was further prohibited and Canada's door was almost closed to the Jews. With the onset of the Great Depression in the 1930s, immigration seeking jobs were understandably not welcome. Like many other countries, Canada locked her doors to jobless immigrants, a policy which was also continued throughout the Second World War. Following the war, those who believed that immigrants and their children posed a cultural problem sought the answer in assimilation. Public policy pressurized immigrants and were particularly and more particularly their children to job aside their ethnic traditions and integrate themselves into the ways of English Canada. In this particular slide, we'll see the ethnic origin, the responses, and Canada in the 1996. The source is Statistics Canada 1998. If we look at the ethnic groups and origins, primarily they were the French, the English, the Chinese, the Italian, German, Scottish, and South Asian. If we look at the single responses, then we will see that the French were primarily at the top of this list. There were other major concerns like the person single origin in total population combined with single multiple responses and then the percentage of combined origin. The next table too talks about the South Asian population in Canada according to places of origin. Source Statistics Canada, Census of Population 2002. If you look at the countries of origin, they include India, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Fiji. Next, in the next column, we see South Asian immigrants before 1971, then from 1971 to 1980. Next column shows from 1981 to the 1990s and next from 1991 to 2001. The next slide shows Indian immigrants by province and period of arrival. This particular slide focuses on top 10 places of residence of Indian immigrants in Canada. If we look at the left panel, the top 10 cities, Toronto, Vancouver, Calgary, Montreal, Edmonton, Ottawa, Hamilton, Winnipeg, amongst the others. And the panel left is corresponding the location of this Indian population in the right column, which describes the number of people located in the various cities mentioned. Source, Statistics Canada 2007. The next slide talks about the very interesting, the merit point system. The point system provides that the independent and sponsored applicants be assessed according 
to their possession of a set of characteristics and each characteristic is assigned a range of merit points. Nine characteristics have been assigned. Education and training, 0 to 20 merit points, one point for each year of the education of training. Personal qualities such as adaptability, motivation, initiative and so on, 0 to 15 points. Occupational demand for the occupation, the applicant would follow 0 to 15 points. Occupational skill from unskilled to professional has 1 to 10 points. Age 0 to 10 points. Arranged employment 0 or 10 points. Knowledge of English or French 0 to 10 points. And so and so forth. So all this while we have been looking at Canada as a nation which is so well known for immigration. Canada is a land of immigrants. Who are the immigrants? Primarily people who relocated to Canada due to the pressures in their own homeland or for better opportunities in this adapted land. Except the native people who have been here for years, most of the people who claim themselves as Canadians have at some point in their life immigrated to Canada as first generations. We have to understand that that defines their racial ethnic identities also. Canada primarily as a nation which talks about the two founding nations that is the English and the French people somehow required laborers to work for this burgeoning industrial society. So along with their people from their own homelands they also allowed initially people from the Chinese origin, people from other parts of the world or the colonies to immigrate here to support their labor force. Now one really needs to understand that it was definitely not the opportunities here that were present in Canada but there were also other factors that pushed several peoples to immigrate to Canada. The moment people from other racial and ethnic backgrounds immigrated to Canada the primarily white settler society had a lot of suspicion about these people. Suspicion primarily being whether these people will be able to adopt this new homeland. This new homeland with the rules and regulations of the founding nations that is the English and the French. Subsequently, the policies that were adopted by the Canadian government to induct immigrants directly corresponds to the wider politics of the formation of the Canadian nation as a land of immigrants. The next slide talks about the Green Paper on Immigration. The Green Paper on Immigration was tabled in the House of Commons in February 3rd, 1975. It resulted in the introduction of a new Immigration Act in 1976 by the federal government which formally recognized the points system. The same categories were not retained but were given different point values. Furthermore, a location factor was introduced. Thus, applicants could obtain up to 5 points if they were willing to locate in areas that needed workers but would lose up to the five points if they intended to go to areas without such need. This act also clearly distinguished among three categories of immigrants, independent immigrants, family class and refugees. Ethnic and racial diversity. This immigration policies resulted in a diverse population in Canada. In the 1991 census, 
more than 30% of Canadians reported an origin other than British or French. But that percentage mostly concentrated in Ontario and Western Canada. Rural areas, small towns, Quebec and Atlantic Canada were home to fewer foreign-born people than the rest of Canada. The number of South Asians in Canada more than tripled from 223000 in 1981 to 917.000 in 2001. The 2001 census showed that 29% of South Asians living in Canada had been born there. 69% were immigrants and 2% were non-permanent residents. Again, in 2006, census showed 443.690 Indian immigrants living in Canada. They were concentrated mostly in Toronto and Vancouver. Thus, compared to the other cities, Toronto and Vancouver stand out as the most culturally and racially diverse cities in Canada. The Multicultural Policy the diversity in population led to the inevitable introduction of the policy of multiculturalism as the state policy of Canada. The policy emerged in the 1970s as a uniquely Canadian policy. A new approach to nation building generated by the Liberal government of Pierre Trudeau. The multiculturalism policy gave explicit recognition at the federal level to Canadians whose origin was non-French, non-British and non-Aboriginal. Thus, the policy served to reconfigure expressions of the Canadian identity in a way that was inclusive of ethnic, cultural and racial minorities. In an effort to unite Canadians for the Second World War, the Department of National War Services had established as early as 1942 an advisory committee on cooperation in citizenship. The committee was charged with five tasks. One, to maintain contact with Canadian citizens of non-British and non-French origin and to seek to interpret their view to the government and to the Canadian public generally. Two, to cooperate with the director of the Bureau of Public Information in distributing news to the foreign language presses in Canada and in explaining public policy as it develops. Three, to maintain close relationships with the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation the National Film Board and other similar services, and the Canadian Council for Education in Citizenship. Four, to encourage cultural activities which may promote mutual understanding and esteem between Canadian citizens of different origin. Five, to interest itself in situations that appear to be producing misunderstanding dissatisfaction or discord among groups of Canadians of European origins, non-French and non-British or between these groups and other Canadian citizens and if it is thought advisable to make representations with respect to such situations to the appropriate bodies or authorities. The B and B Commission Several factors influenced the introduction of multiculturalism policy. Like all political parties, it was a product of its time and a result of political necessity. The 1960s were marked by increasingly troubled English-French relations in Canada. In 1963, in response to the Quiet Revolution in Quebec, which led to a reinvigorated French-Canadian nationalism. Liberal Prime Minister Pearson established the Royal Commission on Bilingualism and Biculturalism, the B&B &B Commission. 
The commission, with its emphasis on two languages and two cultures, provoked a counter-response from Canadians of non-British, non-French and non-Aboriginal origin, especially second-generation Ukrainians. This third force feared that the state would not value their contributors and defined them as second-class citizens. They argued that they had endured the Great Depression along with other Canadians, had sacrificed their children to the national war front and declared themselves to be one bit less Canadians. According to their argument, there should be a new meeting or a new model of citizens participating in the larger society, a model that would address pluralism of ethnic groups. Unlike the melting pot model of the United States America, the idea of a cultural mosaic was preferred. So, with the influx of people from all across the world gathering together to work for this nation called Canada required a policy that would also be able to regulate all these people who had their own idea of a particular nation. The growing discontent amongst the French and English in the 1960s, other historical factors like the Great Depression contributed in a formulation of the multicultural policy in Canada. The multicultural policy was drafted keeping in mind the melting pot policy of the presence of the big brother called the United States of America. That does not necessarily mean that the multicultural policy in Canada or multiculturalism in Canada became a favorite for all the people who had migrated. People like the Ukrainians, they had serious reservations about this policy because they felt that probably this way of inclusion would create a class of second class citizens. Main Aspects of the Multicultural Policy As articulated by Trudeau, the policy of multiculturalism was to involve four main aspects. First, state funding was to be given to the ethnocultural groups for cultural maintenance. Second, cultural barriers to full participation in Canadian society were to be removed. Third, cultural interchange has to be promoted. Fourth, Official language training for immigrants in Canada must be mandatory. The main feature of the new multiculturalism policy was the funding given to support ethnic minority associations. Thus, multiculturalism was an addition to the other groups which received funding from the Canadian state as part of the post-war era. The funding was given to the multiculturalism directorate with the Department of the Secretary of State. From the beginning and up to 1981, funds were given mainly for folklore activists, dance troops and theatre and to a lesser extent for instructions in languages other than English or French. This generated severe criticisms from left-leaning academics in the 1970s who viewed the policy as merely symbolic and largely ineffective or ineffectual in transforming power relations. The policy gave minimum financial support to minorities to combat racism at most spending $27 million a year and obscured both class and gender inequalities within minority communities. Prospects for the future How far multiculturalism as a state policy has succeeded till date remains a debatable proposition. The policy has been criticized too often by people of color who feel that it is nothing more than a policy of ghettoization of the minority communities. Canadians of white origin, on the other hand, 
have felt that the policy has been used to propagate and extend undue favors to the other cultures. The initial fear that a multicultural nation would encourage the influx of unsuitable immigrants has come true to a certain extent. The nation has failed to admit only those who would be able to assimilate quickly into the mainstream Canadian society and thus today's Canada is a mixture of various cultures and traditions. The greater the diversity of the racial and cultural mix, the greater is the need for tolerance and openness in accepting one another as fellow Canadians. With globalization and the ever-increasing movement of people from one country to another, the challenge of appreciating and accommodating cultural differences has become a universal experience. In that sense, a multiculturalism policy is the only solution for a state with such diverse population. It only needs to be seen that the policy is implemented in a proper manner so that every citizen should enjoy in equality the benefits that are put on paper. So as far as this module is concerned, it dealt primarily with the nation that we know as Canada, as a nation which is ever welcoming to the immigrants. But it requires a better understanding of how multiculturalism as a policy was adopted by the Canadian government in the 1970s and the subsequent after effects of these policies. One needs to understand that a policy is adopted by a particular government in a moment of history to deal with the immediacy of the socio-historical and political situation which necessarily does not mean that it will cater to all the groups for which the policy was framed. Primarily, multiculturalism was seen as an ostrich-like effort to combat the various discontents presented in the society of then Canada because the group of new Canadians, especially the people of color who had migrated from several parts of the world, especially the third world for better opportunities vis-a-vis -vis education, job opportunities, felt that this was definitely an eyewash and an effort to propagate the founding nations that is the English and the French people's own interest. Thank you.